Well, the big three are through to the third round. That's right. We started with 128 players, and now we are down to only 32. Things will start moving pretty quickly from here. Roger Federer got angry at the umpire today. A little bit of a anger, a little bit of anger towards Marin Chilich as well. Take a look when Roger Federer puts his hand on the net. You know that he's not happy. He's going to be there a while with the umpire. Uh, Richard Gasquet. Richard Gasquet has almost improved to an 0-20 record against Rafa Nadal. He's working on it. Hopefully he doesn't retire anytime soon, and maybe we will see him hit that great achievement. Novak Djokovic also keeps rolling through. Had a, a fairly tough opponent on clay today, but it didn't look that way, even though he went down a break early. But... Before we get to any tennis, uh, some of you know that I have I was in the hospital the last couple days, and I'm sure most of you probably don't know. I, I really just had time to put a thing on Twitter while I was uh, in the hospital. Uh, a quick little tweet I said and uh, a little bit of watching tennis while I was uh, waiting to find out my fate. So let me just catch you up if you're worried about me or if you, you didn't know about it. I'm sure some people out there are mad saying I unsubscribed because Matt didn't post videos for a, a couple days. So uh, be sure to subscribe back. I have a really good excuse. Uh, a couple days ago while I was actually getting ready for the show, I... Uh, I noticed that my heart rate was up. I could just tell I was short of breath and I had some chest pain, which I thought was odd. And I have an Apple Watch here and I did the, um, the it's an EK, EKG at the hospital. A watch, the Apple Watch has an ECG. I don't know what the difference is, but basically I, I did that thinking maybe it'll tell me if I'm having a heart attack or not because this is really weird whatever's happening to me right now. And it said you show signs of uh, atrial fibrillation, AFib. You may have heard of that before, AFib, where uh, your heart starts racing out of control. When I first went there, the first person to look at me, he wasn't a, a doctor or even a nurse, but he able he's able to uh, run an EKG on people who are just walking into the ER. He said, uh, he said, oh, well, you're not an AFib because no one's heart rate is as low as yours in AFib. But what he didn't know is that I am a tennis player, so my resting heart rate is about 40, sometimes uh, in the low, in the high 30s. Uh, so for me, having a, a resting heart rate at 80, it means my resting heart rate is double, which is definitely not okay. But I guess a lot of people have a resting heart rate of 80. Anyway, so um, we go on to find out that uh, I have this AFib thing. There's danger there because you can have a, a blood clotting, which can turn into a heart attack and, and some other things. Uh, uh, they told me it could, uh, you know, if you let that go unchecked, it, become, it could become a stroke or a, a pulmonary embolism I believe is one of the things they said while I was in the hospital it's all kind of a blur I was able to watch a bit of the Sitsipas match uh, kind of in and out of consciousness in uh, in the hospital uh, anyway so long story short they had to um, put me under they had to electrocute my heart kind of like you see on TV like psh, clear that whole thing you know they had to do a, a more minor version of that to shock my heart back into a proper rhythm it was all uh, very confusing I'm in really good shape which uh, makes it kind of weird but they say you know, these things just happen to some people. You can't really explain it. It's probably just some kind of a genetic thing. You never really know. And they also said, I may be drinking way too much coffee. So we might have to change this to herbal tea tennis, herbal tea break tennis, or nothing but water always hydrated break tennis. I don't know. Uh, they had to shock me. They also had to um, stick a camera. Don't worry, I was out for this. They had to stick a camera all the way down my esophagus and take, which I found out the heart's over here. I didn't know where it was. Anyway, so they had to stick a camera down there and take a look at the heart. The heart looks great. Uh, it's a really weird thing, and I will have to drink uh, way less coffee. Uh, no surprise that I'm kind of scared to drink any coffee at all right now. So for the first time ever, Coffee Break Tennis, I got an empty mug here. Don't worry, we'll have some decaf in there or some herbal tea. I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, but the worst thing of all that they did to me, forget about the shock, the camera down the throat. That does sound pretty horrible, doesn't it? The worst thing. And I'm going to warn you, if it, this is graphic, so I'm going to give you a five-second countdown. You can listen. You don't have to turn off the video, but you can listen. But you might want to look away if you're a bit squeamish, if you don't want to see anything uh, grotesque. So I'm giving you a countdown right now for everyone else. If, if you're brave, you can see. The worst thing they did to me in the hospital of all. In five, four, three, two, one... The worst thing they did is this shave job to uh, do the electrical shock to the heart. You can look again. I put it away. Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I guess in the medical world, that is the proper technique. But when it comes to men's body hair fashion, 
I assure you that is the improper technique to shave a chest. Literally sounds different with water instead of coffee. Today on Coffee Break Tennis, they told me to take it easy at the hospital for a couple of days. So today it's gonna be very easy, a short show. I don't know if it's possible, but we're going to try to take it easy. Of course, we will go through the draw and look at the remaining 32 players. That's 16 matchups that we will get to see on television in the next couple of days. Also, I was in the middle of making a show before I realized maybe it was time to uh, to go to the doctor. I went to the doctor first. They couldn't believe it after a few EKGs. They're like, uh, it doesn't make sense that you're this healthy and young and out of nowhere with no history of AFib, you suddenly have it. So uh, the doctors are actually the ones who told me uh, I gotta go to the ER. Anyways, um, I was in the middle of a show and some of that show right here in the notes, I did uh, make the show, there's no point in editing up. Editing and chopping up that show from a couple days ago now where we are, but I will revisit a couple things Because uh, there's some really good stuff in there We were covering in the last show that no one will ever see and of course we will go through the draw But first let's address this thing with Roger Federer uh, Getting really angry at the umpire no better than uh, listening it to him take a listen to the go straight from the goat's mouth Is that actually Marin? had hit a serve once, you know, while I wasn't in position yet. And I thought he was working on his serve, which I was thought was really odd. But it dawned on me that he must have been upset for a while. And then I told the umpire, like, why didn't you tell me? Because I did not know that he was uh, uh, upset. And he goes like, well, I figured you knew. And I was like, okay, here we are again in a place where you think that I know and then we nobody knows. So it's misunderstandings there. Um, I didn't feel like I was playing particularly slow and with the towels quite honestly if I want to go to the towel now I can't go to the towel anymore it's okay I get it but uh, I really struggled with uh, the idea of well I understand playing to the service pace I've done it as you know in hundreds of matches and I always feel like I don't make my opponent wait very much but uh, clearly Marion wanted to go faster um, now I didn't realize that um, I, I think I told him uh, it, I also haven't played so much lately that I'm not quite understanding the rhythm. Um, but uh, the thing is also obviously when he sets his foot down to get ready for the serve, he's not quite ready yet. He still takes 10 bounces. And uh, I'm not in the mood to stand there and just be his, you know, sort of, here I am so you can get ready. Start bouncing already and I rock up when uh, when I feel like it's also I'm, I'm ready to go. So. I just feel like it was a misunderstanding on many levels. I didn't understand it and figure it out. And I'm, I guess I'm still just new to the new tour. <laughs> just go ahead and say it, Roger. You're not waiting around standing there just to be Marin Cilic's bounce buddy. I thought I thought that was kind of interesting that uh, Federer took it to the next, uh, next level there. But Federer had reason to be upset, I think. Uh, a couple of reasons, actually, because... Marin Cilic had been doing the bounce routine and going over the time and not getting the warning. Roger gets the warning before he's even aware. That's why Roger says, you know, you c communicate with me. There's no communication there. But uh, Roger was caught off guard by that. And I should point out that it's a, it's a different thing. Like, if you get the time violation, not the soft warning, that because Cilic, Cilic, the umpire spoke with him. No warning, just kind of a soft warning, like they said they should have gave Serena at the U.S. Open a few years ago. So Chilich gets the soft warning, Federer gets nothing. He just gets the straight hard warning. And if you do it the second time as the server, you lose a first serve, it's a second serve. That's pretty rough. But as the returner, you just lose the point. You, you, you warning and then point loss as a returner. So Federer was pretty upset about that. But going back to um, Nick Kyrgios at the beginning of the year, at the, uh, the tournaments leading up to uh, the Australian Open, I remember him freaking out. Because they, you know, he says, I'm one of the fastest guys in between serve and going to get the towel and all this because the towel kids aren't allowed to hand a towel because of COVID. They're not allowed to give the towel to the players anymore. Kira says, you know, how's Rafa going to do this? You know, how's Rafa going to make it through here if, if I have to go and get the towel and I'm getting the freaking time violation? And then we saw it with um, uh, Pierre Hugues Herbert. He was saying, if I serve in volley, I'm at the net. I got to walk all the way to the corner to get the towel. And then I got to get ready to serve all in a certain amount of time, whatever it is, to 30 seconds, whatever. He says, uh, you, you guys are killing serve and volley tennis. No one's allowed to serve and volley anymore because there's no way to serve, volley, 
walk from the net and get my towel towel off and then be ready to serve the next point within the the shot clock. So it does change things a lot. And Federer's got a pretty good excuse there saying, I haven't been on tour, so I haven't really figured out uh, how to do the the toweling off. And you heard Federer say it himself, like, I guess I just can't, when I'm returning, I can't use the towel anymore. I guess that's the deal here. Uh, Rafa, ironically, playing Gasquet today, made Gasquet wait to serve a couple of times, I noticed it. But Gasquet... Uh, he didn't seem to mind it too much. I guess everyone understands when you play Rafa, you're just kind of accept that you're going to be waiting at times, whether he's serving or you're serving. Rafa's always toweling and uh, doing all the all the things, <laughs> you know, all that stuff. Anyway, so uh, I thought that was interesting. Federer loses that set when that happens. That was, uh, what was it, the second set? He loses 6-2, I think. And I thought getting angry, even though he says in that clip that he likes that uh, it brought some, uh, you know, some fire to the match a little bit, got him fired up a bit. Uh, he didn't play as well. He didn't focus as well after that. So I don't think it helped him. Overall, a really good match from Roger Federer. I thought Chilich hasn't been playing well. Chilich played very well. And Federer still got through in four. I thought Federer would get through in three if, if Chilich played uh, kind of terrible like we've seen him do sometimes uh, this year. Chilich started off a little choky, right? He had a chance to uh, to break Federer early. I think Federer broke him right away at the beginning of the match, if I remember right. And then Chilch settled in and played pretty great in the tie break. Uh, Chilch threw a double fault in. Other than that, he didn't play that bad in a tie break. Federer just played outstanding. I mean, I, Federer said it himself in some other press that uh, he kind of amazed himself how well he played. Uh, all right, so... Just wanted to get that out of the way, talk about the Federer thing. We'll go through the draw. That's the main thing I want to do today. But first, let's just go through a couple things. Take a look at this. This is a comment that I wanted to start the show a couple days off with a couple days ago before I had to go to the hospital. This is what would have been on that show. Uh, this comment, take a look. AIS says, you're a really nice guy, but delusional when it comes to Federer. He's finished, mate. You think he'll be ready for Wimbledon? That's just three tournaments away. I mean, how can you not watch the guy? And think, wow, he really looks like, uh, you know, he's moving well enough. He's playing well enough. He's executing shots. He's serving well enough to where he could win Wimbledon. I, I, I still think he could do it. Now, Djokovic, if he's there, how does Federer beat him? That's that's tough. But at least Federer did get that win the last time they played. When this picture is taken on my uh, on my MacBook desktop there, Federer did beat him in that World Tour Finals match and beat him pretty good. So at least he's got that in his mind. We're not there yet, but uh, take a look at this. Tennis Channel put this up. I'll show you another clip, but just watch this a little bit. Uh, Federer's moving great. That was always the question. That's why when I look at this comment, you're delusional when it comes to Federer. He's finished. The only thing that matters, because we know he's always going to be able to hit the balls, right? He's going to hit great shots. Can he still move like he did? That's what separates Federer from the rest, you know, from everybody else. He, he anticipates really well, too, which makes his movement that much better. If Federer can move this way like he is, here's another clip of him, actually. If you can't look at just the feet, take a look at the entire body. It's a little easier to see how fast he's moving. And if you watch some courtside foot, I don't have any for you. I'm sorry, but I've seen some around uh, in Geneva, even. You could see it in Doha. People up close watching Federer, you know, you, you see footage of him sliding on the clay or moving great on the hard courts. Uh, practice court footage, stuff like that, where people are up close and you, you get a closer angle. You really see how fast he's moving. It's pretty incredible. Uh, Federer is still one of the best movers on tour. For his uh, power level on serve and his height, he's one of the best, probably the best server still on tour. Uh, and, of course, on grass, his backhand slice it's, it's one of the best backhand slices ever. It's probably the best backhand slice on tour right now. I can't really think of anyone else whose backhand slice compares. Uh, it's very lethal on grass at Wimbledon. The bounce is so low when you can knife, knife the ball like that. Uh, it's going to be even lower on Wimbledon grass. So that's going to be a highly effective shot that we see Federer break out when he uh, plays at Wimbledon. Uh, all the things are there. The question for me is can he keep moving like this? Can he recover? Federer just played a, a pretty tough four-set match with a tie break in there against Chilich today. Uh, so I, I would like to see how he's going to play. He was talking about that on the Tennis Channel desk. He did an interview with them also, and he was saying how three sets with Istamin and two days of rest is going to be a different recovery than uh, four sets with Chilich and one day of rest. So it'll be very interesting to see how he does against Dominic Kupfer. Uh 
Kepfer as Mark Woodford, who is uh, commentating on Tennis Channel Plus, Tennis Channel Everywhere, whatever the heck they're calling it these days. Uh, he put it best. You know, what is Dominic Kepfer? He said, well, he's basically a German tank or a panzer, if you want to be more accurate. Uh, anyways, this guy has big power. The serve is not as good, but off the ground, forehand, backhand, Dominic Kepfer is really good. I think he's a little more dangerous than Chilch, potentially. Chilch played better than I thought he would. Uh, we'll see what Kepfer can do. I don't know if he will step up uh, and really play to the best of his abilities, but there is danger there. Federer, look for Federer to be able to get in on the return games. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if Kepfer can do anything to stop Federer's serving. I think he hit... 15, 16 aces against Chilch today. And Chilch is a pretty good returner. Uh, he, he's got a lot of reach. One last clip, though. Take a listen to this. Federer schooling the journalists, uh, basically telling them how hard courts are really slow these days, so much so that the way the weather is, although it was kind of humid today, but it was still hot, uh, the ball's flying on the clay in Paris. Take a listen. I don't know how to explain it to you, but sometimes people still think clay are, is slow. It's not that slow. It's actually t mostly faster than hard courts nowadays, unless you go to Cincinnati and Shanghai potentially and a couple of indoor events. But <laughs> other than that, I feel like if you're playing on a, on a day where it's actually quite warm, clay can actually be somewhat on the faster side. Now, obviously, what comes into play is bad bounces and sliding, and you can go far back, especially on center court because there's so much room. So things can change there, but... Um, uh, for me and my knee, the good thing is that I got a lot of information out of a match like this. We will keep on getting information tomorrow and the next day. Um, so I hope I can back it up with a, with a, hopefully another good match. And whatever the outcome is, uh, I know um, it was definitely the right choice to come here. Now, the thing is, tomorrow the conditions are going to be a little bit different. It's, uh, it might rain. If it doesn't rain, it's always going to be near raining. It was kind of like that today, but it's going to be even worse tomorrow. The conditions will be slower, so we'll talk about how that's going to affect some big matchups tomorrow that uh, might have been dangerous with the way the conditions have been, but now they change a little. Tomorrow's going to be noticeably slower conditions. Uh, all right, uh, let me see. I wanted to show you this. These conditions especially are good for Rafa. Take a look at this. This is Rafa compared to October, I think, was when the French Open was last year. Whenever it was, yeah, it was, you know, the fall classic, something like October time. Uh, the bounce is seven inches higher now for Rafa Nadal in these condition, conditions versus uh, the time of year they played it last year. Anyway, so that that's a factor here. That's going to make it even easier on Rafa to... Uh, to terrorize his opponents. You know, people always think Roth is really good on slow courts. That's why he's the king of clay. Ah, he's really good where his ball bounces higher. And if it's fast and high, watch out. These conditions are great for Rafa. I don't see Djokovic or Federer being able to beat him here in these kind of conditions. Although Djokovic is playing really well, you give him a chance. He's got the two-handed backhand. That does make it easier. But after the way the final went and better conditions for Djokovic last year, it's really hard to imagine either Federer or Djokovic being able to beat Rafa here. I wanted to show you this also. This is uh, the formula, and this is similar. We really saw it today with Chilich. Uh, this is something I've implemented in my own game, and trust me, you have to be able to hit the serves and make them go in and hit them hard for this to work. But once you get pretty good at serving and you can hit different spots and different spins, uh, it works pretty well. This is um, the GOAT formula is what I'm going to call this. Take a look. This is where this is where Rafa was directing traffic against Popperin. And that match was tough, right? Popperin should have won that third set. He kind of choked that. I mean, he definitely. There's no excuse. Uh, he choked that, that set away. So take a look at this graphic. Take that ball out of the middle. There's one shot in the middle. It's like 7% or something. Split that up with the sides. He's going out wide to the popper and backhand two-thirds of the time, and he's going the other way to the forehand one-third of the time to keep you honest. You set up a lane of traffic, and you make it effective. The best way to explain this is what Federer does so often. Uh, I learned this. I mean, if you watch enough, you can kind of see, but I didn't know how big the numbers were until I was watching a Craig O'Shaughnessy. He's the stats guru that used to be on the Djokovic team just doing analysis of st statistical data to uh, – kind of come up with game plans with Djokovic for. Uh, anyways, he was saying how Federer will serve out wide, whether it's the deuce with the slice serve going to the forehand or the add flat out wide, add court away from the backhand uh, first serve. Federer will hit those about two-thirds of the time, maybe even a little bit more than that. But let's just say it's two-thirds, 
And then you go hit the T one third of the time because it catches people off guard. So if I keep hitting that slice serve, you know, right? You hit it and you kind of you kind of curl around the ball a little. That's how Federer gets that deuce court ball. And you'll notice, you'll see the speed goes down because he's cutting it so much. It takes a little, you know, it's, when you hit it, just boom. You just put the strings right through the ball like that. That's how you hit the big bomb. That's how you hit 120 miles an hour. And then when you hit it hard, but you're cutting around it a little, the ball loses speed because you're just not grabbing as much of it with the string. You're not Im imparting as much force on the ball. So Federer will hit that slider wide. Over and over. You saw it against Chilich a lot today. Against Istamin. take a look at this. This is the graphic that they had for Istamin. Uh, now, keep in mind, Istamin's forehand is the weaker shot. He's more consistent on his backhand side. So even then, is going heavy out wide for the most part in the deuce court. Uh, excuse me, in the ad court to the backhand, but not quite as much. You can see he's hitting that deuce wide to the forehand of Istamin more frequently than he's hitting the ad wide. But... Typically, what you do is you keep hitting that spot, and you make it work. You don't hit one and lose the point and then hit the other way. You hit it again and again until you've won you know, multiple points in a row on that side, and that guy starts to lean there or expect that serve, and that's when you take it up the tee, and that's exactly what Rafa does, that graphic I showed you put on the screen again. That's the first strike after a first serve. I think in this match, it was about 80% of the time he was making it a forehand meaning the return wasn't good enough to stop him from hitting a forehand. You try to force Rafa to hit a backhand on a return sometimes. Maybe uh, maybe you can do it sometimes. Anyway, so against Poprin, you see about, just like Federer's serve patterns, about two-thirds of the time he goes with the obvious choice because when you serve out wide as Federer, you get a ball that comes short into the middle of the court, you go the other way. It's like a V-shape. Serve out wide, big forehand the other way. Serve out wide to the backhand, add a forehand cross court the other way. That's how you that's how you do the uh, serve plus one. That's so important for, uh, for for everybody on tour, but especially the big three. They really are the best at winning those really quick serve goes in. First ball I see is a winner. Serve plus one. That's what they're all about. Or a ball that's almost a winner where I come in the net and clean it up with an overhead or, or an easy uh, shoulder high volley. So you see Rafa constantly hitting the backhand, swinging Popper and off the court. We're on clay where the bounce is higher. So he's getting it high. You're getting all these high backhands and you're out of position. So even if you get it back, you're so far out of position. Rafa can usually hit a winner the other way. He gets to that V pattern eventually. So I thought that was interesting how he's basically doing what we always see Federer do on serve. Next time you watch Federer, notice how he's most frequently hitting that wide serve and then he'll sneak one up the middle to surprise you. He'll hit a, a lot of aces like that when he starts going T after he uh, kind of puts you on notice. And, and it's harder because with all that angle, especially in the deuce court when you can hit that slice, it's a lot of uh, coverage. You know, you can really get that thing off the court. With the T serve, you really can't. You can just hit it straight in a straight line up the back wall. Uh, that's why if you start going there first, you know, it, it might not be as effective. You really got to get them leaning one way. Uh, last thing, this comment from Damian Byrne. 40 or not, Fed's still able to access parts of the court. Few players have ever found forehand in the last game defied physics. That uh, win over Istvan, Federer literally hit everything. At one point, he hit a tweener. It went out, but I heard that it was uh, 87 miles an hour, I think is the number. Almost a 90-mile-an-hour tweener. So Federer's playing great. I'm not delusional. The guy can still win Wimbledon. The biggest question mark is, what about Djokovic? Will, will he be there? Will he get upset, hopefully, for the Fed fans? Because I don't know if Federer can beat Djokovic especially after uh, 2019. Uh, Dominic team, really quick, he's out. I just want to show you this. Uh, they were showing his average speeds off the ground. D uh, team himself said there's he's down a certain percentages in every aspect of his game, but don't worry, he's working hard to get it back. In 2019, Dominic team, average forehand speed, 81 miles an hour, 77 on the backhand. Uh, this year, that dropped a lot. 78. You might think three miles an hour is not a much, but you know, this is the average. This is the average of every forehand he hits in a match. It's not going as high. That means he's not hitting as many big forehands, and he's hitting uh, a more slow forehands. Not you know not very good shots. Uh, 74 on the backhand, so down three miles an hour average on both. Today it says that's the day he lost first round. So that's the day that uh, Dominic Team lost first round against Pablo Andahar. Not such a fluke that he beat Federer now. He took out Dominic Team too. Lost in five sets today. Uh, today, it was going up, but it was still down overall uh, on one mile an hour on the forehand, two on the backhand. So at least he's in the right direction. But I thought that was an interesting uh, thing to take a look at. All right, let's go through the draw, and then we'll get out of here because I told the doctors I would take it easy. So we got to take it easy. 
Uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, tomorrow is bottom half of the draw day. So let's look at this part of the draw. We'll start with Sasha Zverev. This guy, R. Roman Safil. Sa 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 I don't know how to say it. Safulian. 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 I don't know how to say it. Uh, if you look, I didn't even watch that match, but if you look it up, he's not very good on clay, right? He wins more on other surfaces. He wins more on hard court than he does on clay. Yet, Sasha Zverev, uh, he, he came through him in three sets today, but two tiebreakers. Then, of course, Oscar the Otter. Remember, uh, shout out to the patron saints, patreon.com forward slash coffee break tennis. Go there if you want to join the team and help this show continue to go and grow. I couldn't, I really couldn't do it without the patron saints. Um, I did a show just for them sometimes during the majors, although overwhelmingly patron saints say, don't make shows exclusive just for us. You know, we, we want to support you. So there's just more shows in general for all the people to see. So this, so they want everyone to see the shows. That's why I don't do that as much. I probably still will do a patron saint uh, bonus podcast occasionally here. But uh, I remember doing one on Oscar Ada 2019 when Federer was going to play him. And, uh, you know, he's, he's got a pretty good game. But for Zverev to go down 3-6, three, 3-6, six, three, six, right, he, he cleaned it up. We know Oscar is pretty good. He's, he's kind of like a, a, a crappy version of Sasha Zverev. I mean, he's got a really good backhand. Backhand up the line is money. Uh, he can serve pretty big, not as big as Sasha Zverev. And the forehand, it's good, but that's the side that will break down occasionally, more so for Oscar the Otter. Anyway, so uh, I remember him well from 2019. A lot of people thought it was going to be two upsets that day, right? Dominic team went down that same day, and it looked like Sasha Zverev was going to be down. Good for him that he came out. He took care of it like a professional. He finished it with a bagel. But you don't want too many of these tough matches early on. And next up, he's got a guy who's really good on clay, and that's uh, Laszlo Jetta. Jetta, however you say his uh, last name. I think it sounds like Jetta, kind of Jetta. He's a Serbian. Now, he played five. Tomorrow, the conditions, you heard Federer earlier say, uh, you know, when, when the conditions are hot and fast like this, uh, clay court plays faster than a lot of the hard courts on tour. Uh, tomorrow, it's going to play a lot slower and damper. So watch out for Laszlo Jera and Sasha Zverev tomorrow. Jera did have to beat Ketsmanovic. He's another Serbian. I'm sure they know each other's games really well. I think he lost to Ketsmanovic earlier this year. Maybe um, I think the last time they played on clay that Jera lost. So he gets him this time in five. He also had to beat uh, Corentin Moutet, who is a Frenchman. who's probably pretty fired up in that match playing in France at the French Open. Uh, that was a, a pretty tough match. I think that was... He came through that one in four sets, but there's three sevens in there. A couple tie breaks and a 7-5 in the fourth. So maybe Laszlo is uh, going to be kind of worn out, and that will be good for Sasha Zverev. But Sasha Zverev, he's also had a five-setter and a couple tie breakers uh, when, uh, when he won against the guy's name, I can't say. So watch out for Jarrett. That could be a little tricky. Kini Shikori, he came through in five. Kachanov, you know, pretty good player. That's a little tough. Uh, he's got Laxanen next, a Swiss guy that you don't really see a whole lot of. He's not always doing a lot of winning, so could be a good draw. He came through in four uh, against Roberto Batista Agut, who is now out. I think Nishikori, uh, it'll be interesting to see how Nishikori recovers, but uh, Nishikori will have a hard time with Zverev. Um, I think Nishikori took a set off of Sasha in Rome, I want to say, but he did not beat him. Uh, Zverev, the toughest challenge, probably Jera. Whether he gets a tired Nishikori or Laxanen, that will be a little easier. But it won't get easier after that in the quarterfinals because he's either going to get Del Bonus, who's really good on clay, Fonini, who's, you know, he's a mystery. Uh, uh, Davidovich Fokina, he's, he's young, still coming up, pretty talented. Uh, don't think he'll get past Kasper Rude, though. That's the danger. I really like Kasper Rude coming through here now. Unless he somehow loses to Fonini or Del Bonus. But uh, against Sasha Zverev, I like Kasper Ruud. I like him a lot. Now, the conditions are playing good. If Sasha can have a great serving day, maybe he could take out Kasper Ruud like we saw in Madrid with Berrettini. But I don't know. I really like Kasper Ruud here. I think it's going to be pretty good for him to come through this section, especially with what we've seen from Zverev so far. We'll see how he does against Lazlo Jarrett. That's a, that's a big one tomorrow. Steph Tsitsipas, he won pretty easy against uh, Martinez. That was the one I, I watched in the hospital, kind of in and out, falling asleep and waking up over and over. Uh, it was kind of a tricky match. The score doesn't look like it, but I remember watching, and there was uh, a lot of danger times in that match. It looked like, oh, 
Steph is about to lose control of this match. Uh, when I came back, you know, when I looked at the score after, I was kind of shy. I was after the surgery, I think, uh, leading into the surgery. I was watching it, and then after the surgery, electric shock, a heart, whatever the heck, they put me under. Uh, after I came out from being put under, I was kind of surprised to see the score line because maybe I'm delusional. Comment below if, if, if maybe I uh, just was imagining that because I was so uh, sleep deprived. But it looked like Sitsipas was struggling, even though it's a pretty easy score line. He'll get John Isner tomorrow. The conditions are not going to be as fast. You would think, you know, that's bad for Medvedev, who's going to play Opelka. But it's going to be good tomorrow against Isner and Opelka. That's going to mute their serves a bit. I like Steph to come through. I was going to say Isner will have a shot, but now that I know the conditions are going to slow down so much tomorrow, I I don't give Isner much of a chance now. Stevie Johnson wins in five. Pablo Carina Busta comes through in four against Kukakad. Kukakad. That, that guy's got to be French. Enzo. Enzo Kusakad. Uh, he, he beat Gerasimov. I didn't see Busta's match, but uh, if he beat Gerasimov, he must have been playing all right. He had a tie break in the first. Uh, Boost is going to come through Stevie Johnson, you would think. I mean, it's amazing that Stevie Johnson's even in the third round here. He's come through five sets in the last match. I like Busta through there. I like Steph to beat Busta, but we know Busta can play pretty well. Uh, especially, I, know, I, know, I just don't see it. Sitsipas looks too good, even though... He was struggling at times. I did see him come up with great shots to turn it around. So, I mean, it does make sense that he won in straight sets because whenever I saw him run into some danger, he, it looked like he was usually able to break right back if his serve was broken or whatever was going wrong at the time. Uh, if he gets through Isner and isn't too tricky of a match, I, I don't see him having a hard time with Busta. Uh, Jerome, another kind of surprising name here in the third round, Marcus Jerome. He will play Christian Garin. I would like Green, but Green had to go five sets with Mackie McDonald. If it's another long battle, I'll give Marcus Jerome a shot. He is a good little warrior of a tennis player. And, of course, we got Medvedev, who's all of a sudden looking a lot better. Uh, he said it himself that these courts are playing more like a hard court. It's because of the conditions. It's very dry and very hot. Uh, there's going to be a lot of humidity tomorrow. There was some humidity today with the Federer match. But if it gets back to the uh, hot and dry, which it should, after tomorrow... I like Medvedev to keep doing well here and eventually lose to Sitsipas. But you never know. Stranger things have happened, and Medvedev, he's embracing it. He's uh, he's having a good time here. He'll play Opelka, like I said, with the Isner match. And Sitsipas, the conditions are going to make that a little easier on Medvedev, so I expect those guys to come through. All right, top half of the draw where the good stuff is. Djokovic will play Ricardus Barankis. Uh, one thing I was saying in that show that we didn't get the post because I had to go to the hospital and everything, uh, Baronkis is one of those guys where I remember seeing him up close in Atlanta one time thinking, why is this guy not like a top 20 player? This guy's amazing. Uh, I think he was a, a top junior. I think he was, I don't want to say he was number one in the world as a junior, but maybe he was. I, I, I can't remember for sure, but he was he was a, a highly ranked, really effective junior player. We know that doesn't always translate, but if Baronkis was a little taller, you would think he would be like a regular top 20 player. Uh, anyway, so Djokovic will get him next. Djokovic will get him. He'll crush him. It's probably straight sets. Maybe I could see Broncos taking one set off of him, possibly. Uh, Cecchinato. I mean, will he play? Will he beat Musetti? Musetti had a, a pretty easy straight sets win over Nishioka. Threw a bagel on David Goffin, who started playing a lot better. I did watch that. I didn't see the match with uh, Nishioka, but I did see most of Musetti and David Goffin. And Musetti was playing great. Goffin, not so good. And then in the end... David Goffin was playing a lot better, but Musetti kind of lucky to get through 7-5, 7-6 after that first set. Uh, Cecchinato, of course, he beat Djokovic three years ago, I think it was, here at the French Open. Uh, he threw a bagel down. Oh, excuse me, no, that was Baronkis. I put that note down here on Duckworth. All right, it's Ducky. But Baronkis is throwing down bagels. Uh, there was a couple breadsticks right here against uh, Demon Hour for Cecchinato, even though he won in four sets. A couple of breadsticks there. So Cecchinato's playing well. We know he loves it here on the clay. Don't think he's going to beat Djokovic again, but I give him a shot against Musetti, so we might see Musetti or Cecchinato. Pick pick your Italian for Djokovic in the round of 16. Uh, Peter Freeman said, I will be very surprised if Federer beats Berrettini. Berrettini's looking very good. He gets Sunwu Kwan next. I think he'll come through uh, probably in straight sets again. Uh, or actually, he did uh, against Daniel Taro. He did drop a set. Uh, I think in Serbia, where he won 
and he beat Karatsev in the final that same day where Karatsev beat Djokovic in Serbia in the first Serbia. There was two Serbia ATP 250s this year, remember? Berrettini dropped a, sh- uh, dropped a set to, against Daniel Taro, Taro, however you say his last name. Uh, he dropped a set there as well, so I don't know, maybe that was in the back of his mind and, and it happened again. He let off a little bit. But I expect it to come through Sunwoo Kwan, Kwan Tron, and Federer Kepfer. That's a tough one. Uh, I think we already I already said some stuff about this, but Kepfer, he, he's dangerous. He's dangerous. It'll be an interesting test for Federer. I, I like Federer to win that match. Uh, I'll say in four again, most likely another four-set match for Federer. It just depends how Kepfer plays with the pressure of playing against Federer. Is it going to be one of these stupid night matches where there's no one allowed there? I hate that. Take a look at one of these pictures. Uh the night matches where they make you wait, right? Play is done. Nadal could have gone on court right after Federer won today, but instead you wait several hours. I think it was about three hours wait after Federer won for him to go out there and do this night match with no one there. It's it's very strange. If Federer has a night match with Kepfer with no fans there, will that make it easier on Kepfer? Will that be hard on Federer because it's such a strange thing to do? Uh, these could be factors. It, it, it could be close. Big key for me is how does Kepfer deal with the Federer serve? Like I said, he hit about 16 aces, I think, against uh, Chilch today. Chilch is a long guy. Hard to blow aces by a guy with such long reach. So we'll see how Kepfer does. But better believe in rallies, Kepfer is going to be able to knock a deal some blow, Not knockout blows, hopefully. He'll be able to deal some blows to Roger. Uh, Rafa comes through Gasquet like uh, pretty easy. Uh, some people might be surprised how that second set went. But to me, Gasquet was just, I've lost to this guy like 16, 17, 18, whatever it is, times. Uh the only people allowed, right, was an empty stadium, but there was a lot of, you know, Benoit Pair was there with the hair coming out of the bottom of his mask. You know, he's playing in front of his friends, at least, and I think he really just gave it everything he had, and Rafa let off just a little bit, because uh, Gasquet played really well. I think he was down 5-2, to make, and then he made it 5-all. Played really well, almost went to a tie break, couldn't quite take it there. Uh, Yannick Sinner, even though that first match was um, a five-setter, I, I was pretty impressed. You know, f- look at Felix Auger. Felix Auger, who uh, lost to Andreas Seppi, who goes on. Who, who did Seppi? He lost to Quan in three sets like it was nothing. That should have been Felix Auger there. He should have beat. You know, I like Sinner for a lot of reasons, but number one, he's the most mentally tough young guy out there. He reminds me of the young Rafa I'm fond of saying. Uh, so for him to come through, you know, being in a hole and come through that match, pretty impressive. He was down two sets to one, dropped that third set in a tie break against Pierre Hugues Herbert, who's playing in France with a French crowd, very pro uh, pro Herbert. So I, I, it's it's amazing to me that Felix Auger is, is crumbling like this mentally. Uh, it makes me kind of sad, actually. I hope he can uh, get it together. But in the mental department, you know, he's got all the talent in the world. In the mental, mental department, he's, uh, he's got an issue there. Sinner, no issue. I expect him to come through uh, Michael Emer. Monfils, I'm just glad he got a win, but he he's out to Emer. I don't I think Monfils should have been able to find a way to win that match, honestly. Uh, Schwarty D is looking to uh, make this his year, turn it around, right? Turn his year around, I mean, make this his tournament. Uh, Cole Schreiber, kind of surprised against Karasev, but Cole Schreiber, is, you know, he's one of the best players on tour. He's a veteran. I heard on Tennis Channel, they love to quote Andy Roddick saying, experience is overrated and um, confidence is underrated. I'll take confidence over experience. Well, Cole Schreiber has a lot of experience, and it's kind of hard to replicate. Interesting thing in that match was that Cole Schreiber, uh, he started hitting a lot of deep but no-pace floaty balls, and Karatsev was just missing. You know, Karatsev, he really likes the pace coming in at him and take it early from the baseline and redirect all the power. He's really good with his hands. He's, he's kind of like Djokovic or Andre Agassi, even. I've heard people compare Karatsev to. So Cole Schreiber... Gave him a very different looking ball. Did it a lot. Did it at some key moments. And Karatsev really didn't have any answers. Uh, Cole Schreiber has been, um, you know, he's always an effective player. The interesting thing about Cole Schreiber is he plays with one grip. He hits this uh, forehand, but this is a backhand grip. A one-handed backhand, and then flip it, and you got a forehand. He literally uses the same grip uh, on both shots, forehand and backhand. I always thought that was kind of interesting. So Cole Schreiber and Schwarty D., We'll give Cole Schreiber, he's good everywhere. You know, he has a lot of experience, and I know confidence is better than experience. I mean, just look at some of the young guys who come out of nowhere. They don't have much experience. They have no experience on tour, but they got a lot of confidence. Look at Yannick Sinner. Look at Musetti. Uh, Cole Schreiber, after a couple wins here, probably has a lot of confidence too now, especially after beating uh, Karatsev, who's uh, one of the hottest players on tour. So watch out, Diego. Cole Schreiber has the confidence 
and uh, the experience. I'll take Diego and four, but you never know with Cole Schreiber, the cult of pickle. Uh, Basilashvili went down to Alcaraz in three. Struff, of course, took out Andre Rublev. I mean, I like Struff a lot. I like his game a lot. I think it's good here. But Alcaraz, this is an opportunity for him. He could come through here. He could even beat uh, Cole Schreiber or Diego Schwartzman. He could book another chance after the embarrassment in Madrid with Rafa Nadal. How exciting would that be? But it's going to be tough enough with Jan Leonard Struff. <laughs> tough enough with Struff. Uh, hit the music. We're going to get out of here. I wanted to say one more thing about Yannick Center. The big thing with him is the serve. His match today with Gianluca Major. He had a little bit of a trouble in that match today. And for me, the big difference uh, was that Sinner doesn't have the serve so that sometimes Major, Magger, however you say his name, uh, he can get in to some service games because Sinner doesn't have the big boom boom to put him away. Uh, Sinner it needs to hit spots better, needs to hit a bigger serve. I, I think he's working on it and, and it's going to come eventually. But Major, you see with him, he had a pretty big serve, so that made it to where, you know, you, when you watch the big three and they come up against a guy who's serving hot, and redlining his game a lot of times like Major was, they just make sure they hold serve. Well, with Sinner, sometimes if someone's really going for it, they're going to get some breaks against him because he doesn't have, you know, the serve that just says, no, no, I'm going to hold, you know, four times in a row against you no matter what you're doing because I'm going to hit the spots or hit the big enough serves. All right, um... I'm supposed to take it easy, but we will be back tomorrow. Probably just do an audio-only podcast to make it a little easier on me. I'm going to try to hit some tennis balls tomorrow and see how I feel. The funny thing was, they said to me, uh, no, the tennis is good. That's why your heart is so healthy and strong, and that's why you're able to be an AFib for uh, you know 24 hours straight and still have your heart rate down at like 80 or 70-something. So um, I'm going to keep playing the tennis, but they did say the interesting thing is uh, you might want to cut back on the coffee. So uh, comment below if you have any ideas for a new show name. Back tomorrow. See ya!